Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. This is the third talk in the series of talks on the Sato Tate conjecture. And today we're very happy to have Drew Sutherland, who's speaking on arithmetic L functions and their Sato Tate distributions. And Drew, is it okay for, we, for us to record this talk and post it to YouTube? Yes, it is okay to post it to YouTube. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you for the invitation to speak in this seminar. Uh, when I first heard about the Vantage Seminar last fall, I thought it was a wonderful idea, um, something I wish I had thought of. And then I was very excited when Rachel asked me to speak in this seminar. And then I was even more excited when she asked me to join her as a co-organizer. Um, so this has been a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to a lot of exciting uh, seminars coming in the future, but let's uh, start with this one and let me get started. So I thought I would kick off with a question of Nick Katz. Uh, this is from 2012, when he noted a simple thing that we don't know. So let X be a nice curve, say defined over Q, smooth, projective, geometrically integral. For each prime P, we can compute the trace of Frobenius, which we could uh, do by taking P plus one minus the number of FP rational points on the reduction of our curve modulo P. And we know from the they bounds, we're going to get some integer between 2g, whose absolute value is bounded by 2g times the square root of p. And if we normalize the trace by dividing by the square root of p, we're going to get some real number between minus 2g and 2g. So in particular, the genus is bounded below by the absolute value of the normalized trace divided by 2 for every prime. And so you might imagine that if we look at enough prime, at Frobenius traces for enough primes p, eventually we could push the genus up to its actual value. This lower bound would become sharp. And Katz asked whether that was always possible. Now, in the case of genus one, we know that it is. The Sato Tate conjecture says that we're going to have a distribution, a semicircular distribution that's going to extend all the way to the edges of the interval. And so if we sample enough uh, normalized Frobenius traces, we'll eventually see one that's large enough to prove that we have a genus one curve. In fact, as soon as we see one that's non-zero, we, we know that we have one, a genus, a curve of a genus at least one. But then you might ask, what about g greater than one? And astonishingly, we don't know. For g equals two, the best we can say is that the normalized trace Frobenius will at least be bigger than two thirds, if an infinitely often. And this is a highly non-trivial, very recent result of Noah Taylor uh, from 2018. And once we go past genus two, we know essentially nothing. Even proving that the Frobenius traces are non-zero infinitely often is a hard problem. So this should give us pause. To, it, I give this example just to illustrate how challenging uh, the question we're considering is. I mean, we're analyzing the shapes of these distributions, but even to know that they're non-trivial uh, is hard to prove. Okay, so with that dose of humility, let us press on. So I'll just recall the definition of the L function of a curve or of, equivalently of its Jacobian. This is defined as an Euler product uh, taken over primes of the field of definition of the curve, in our case, Q. And for each prime, the polynomial L sub P that appears in the Euler product is coming from the numerator of the zeta function of the reduction of the curve modulo P. And we know this L polynomial has integer coefficients. It's of degree 2G, and it's reciprocal to the characteristic polynomial of, of the Frobenius endomorphism of the Jacobian. Now, those who study L functions sort of in the large in a, in a context that's uh, much bigger than the one we're considering, often find it uh, interesting to focus on a subset of L functions that satisfy a set of axioms that we really expect every reasonable L function should satisfy. And so this, these were laid out by Selberg. So this class of L functions is known as the Selberg class. I'm actually going to restrict to a subset of the Selberg class, those that have Euler factors, Euler representations where the Euler factors are defined by polynomials. So we'll call this the polyno polynomials Selberg class. And the four properties that L functions in the polynomial Selberg class have are one, they should have an analytic continuation that's holomorphic away from S equals one. There two, there should be some choice of gamma factors that will make the completed function, L function, satisfy a functional equation 
<clears throat> for some choice of this uh, complex number epsilon, which has absolute value one, we should have a functional equation of this form. And we can define the degree of the L function in terms of the shape of these gamma factors. Third, an, uh, an L function in the Selberg class should have coefficients that don't grow too quickly. They should satisfy what's known as the Ramanujan bound. And finally, our L function should have an Euler product. We should be able to express it as a product over primes where we're taking some integer polynomial and plugging in P to the minus S where S is a complex variable and then inverting. And each of, for all but finitely many primes, these uh, L polynomials should have degree equal to the degree of the L function. And so if we take a, a curve, a nice curve over Q and normalize it, get, put it uh, normalize it appropriately so it fits within this framework of analytic L function, that means we want the axis of symmetry to be at one half rather than one in the case of a curve. We obtain an L function that automatically satisfies properties three and four. The property three comes from the Weil bounds and property four comes just by definition. We're defining the L function of a curve in terms of an Euler product. And conjecturally, any L function that comes from a, a curve or an abelian variety defined over a number field is going to satisfy all four properties. And the first two, satisfying the first two properties is equivalent to uh, satisfying the Hasse conjecture. And in the case of genus one curves, we know this is true via the modularity theorem. So one remarkable fact about the Selberg class of L functions is that it, it imposes um, some real rigidity to the, the set of L functions that we're considering. And one striking example of this is known as strong multiplicity one. This is the theorem of 2001, which says that if I have two Dirichlet series that both lie in the Selberg class with polynomial Euler factors, and the Dirichlet coefficients at prime indices agree for all but finitely many primes, then they actually must be the same L function. So in other words, if we have an L function in the Selberg class, it's automatically determined by all but finitely many coefficients A sub P. And we can even pick, we're free to pick, choose the primes that we, for which we want to ignore some A sub P. And this will be very convenient in particular in situations where maybe it's hard to compute certain AP, but you have a good method for computing lots and lots of them. So henceforth, we're going to assume that we're always working with L functions that lie in this Selberg class. And for curves to over number fields, there's a natural choice of gamma factors, uh, which I've denoted here gamma sub C. And so we'll define our completed L function by taking the G power of gamma sub C. And we then expect our uh, completed L function to satisfy a functional equation in which there are two parameters that are appear. There's the root number epsilon, which in for curves over number fields is always going to be plus or minus one. And an analytic conductor, this is a, a positive integer. And you can take as its definition, it's the, the unique positive integer for which this functional equation actually holds. Now, one of the virtues of having a functional equation is it's actually really hard for L functions to satisfy a functional equation. And this is what really is behind the multiplicity one phenomenon. Um, and we can test this and we can test the validity of the coefficient of the coefficients of the Dirichlet series we're considering explicitly by defining a function S of X in terms of the inverse Mel Mellon transform of the gamma factors at infinity. And so we define this as a sum over N go going from one to infinity but we're always free to truncate this sum if we wish. So the way I've defined S of X, our completed L function is gonna look like an integral of S, over S of X over X going from zero to infinity. And we're then going to have a, an analog of the functional equation that's satisfied by S. But because this inverse Mellon transform decays quite rapidly for any sufficiently large choice of const a positive constant C sub naught, if we truncate this series by only considering the Dirichlet coefficients a sub n for n less than or equal to c sub naught times x, we get a very good approximation to this function s of x. And we can compute a, a, an explicitly bounded error term that tells us how far our approximation 
differs from the true value. And so our strategy is then this, we fix some small set of primes and these would be primes for which maybe we don't know exactly what the elf, the Euler factor is at that prime, or we don't know what A sub P is. So in the case of hyperelliptic curves, a common choice is to take S to be the set of primes containing just two. That's the one prime that's really, can be really tricky to deal with. And we also assume we have an upper bound on the conductor of our L function. So in the case of a hyperelliptic curve, we could just take the discriminant of, of, of our favorite model of the curve. And there are then only finitely many possibilities for the root number, which has to be plus or minus one, and the conductor, which has to divide our chosen upper bound. And also for the Euler factors at primes in our set of excluded primes s. These Euler factor, these uh, L polynomials have integer coefficients, and the coefficients are bounded by the Bay bound. So there's only finitely many different possibilities. And now let's suppose we can efficiently compute a sub n for all the n's up to some bound proportional to the square root of our bound on the conductor, provided we're only, we're only required to do this for the n's that are not divisible by a prime in our excluded set. We now define a quantity that measures how far our truncated function s of x is from satisfying the functional equation that we know it has to satisfy when we plug in x equal to some multiple of our conductor, a square root of our conductor. And we can test this for every possible choice of root number, candidate conduct for the conductor, and candidate for L polynomials for primes in our excluded set S. And if we ever reach a point where all but one choice makes the error larger than our explicit error bound, we know we must have the wrong choice. Our S sub naught cannot actually be the truncated version of the true S, function S that we're looking for. And so we can discard that choice. And the strong multiplicity one theorem tells us that as long as we make this constant C sub one big enough, this is guaranteed to happen eventually. And one can explicitly determine a set of candidate values of how big this constant needs to be. And one of them is guaranteed to work. And in practice, uh, in the case of hyperelliptic curves, we did this in a project for genus two curves. We were always able to take C1 equal to 16. And in some recent work on genus three curves, we typically will take C1 to be 30, okay? But if you have a choice of C1 that doesn't seem to be working, if you're left with too many possibilities, you just increase it until it does work. Now, of course, I should note as a footnote, this is all subject to our assumption that the L function we're considering actually lies in the Selberg class. But if it doesn't, if it were ever to turn out that we couldn't rule out all but one possibility, we would have on our hands an explicit counterexample to the Hasabe conjecture. Okay, just a, a side comment on conductor bounds. Um, you might wonder, how do we know, how did I, we come up with this integer m that bounds the conductor? Well, we know that there's only uh, finitely many primes that can divide the conductor, these are going to be the primes, uh, they have to lie within the primes of bad reduction for our, for the Jacobian of our curve, which are certainly contained in the primes of bad reduction for the curve. And there are explicit bounds one can compute given by Brumer and Kramer on the power of each prime that, that can appear in the conductor. I've shown them in this table here. Now these don't give bounds that are optimal in most cases. So a better strategy whenever you can is to take um, an, an integral model for your curve, one that is uh, as, has, as uh, is as minimal as possible, and then use its discriminant as an upper bound on your conductor. We know that that always works for hyperelliptic curves. And if you define the discriminant appropriately, one expects that this should hold in general. Okay, so we've talked about uh, the Selberg class of L functions. I now want to consider a slightly more precise notion of a class of L functions of interest. These are the analytic L functions that are described in a wonderful paper by Farmer, Patale, <clears throat> Ryan, and Schmidt in 2019. They define a class of analytic L functions, which satisfy all the properties that uh, we, the four properties we laid out for uh, L functions in the Selberg class, as well as a few others, and they add some more refined information that uh, an L function is required to satisfy to be considered an analytic L function, but conjecturally all the L functions in the Selberg class 
with polynomial Euler factors do satisfy those properties. And among the universe of all analytic L functions, one can distinguish those of arithmetic type. These are analytic L functions for which there is some integer W arithmetic, an arithmetic weight, and a number field F such that when we multiply each Dirichlet coefficient A sub N by an appropriate power of N, that power is going to be N raised to the arithmetic weight divided by two, we wind up with an algebraic integer in the ring of integers of the number field F. So, so in order to be an arithmetic L function, there must exist some W and some F for which this is true for every N. The smallest F and W that work are known as the field of coefficients and the arithmetic weight of the L function L of S. And for curves over number fields, the field of coefficients is always going to be Q. That doesn't actually depend on the, the field of definition of, of the curve itself or of an abelian variety. So we always will get a, what's known as a rational L function, an arithmetic L function whose field of coefficients is Q. And for curves in abelian varieties, the arithmetic weight is always going to be one, which is the same as the motivic weight. And more generally, one expects that if, you have, if you're ever given an L function that comes from a motive, say a pure motive of weight W, the motivic weight W should be the same as the arithmetic weight. And in fact, we expect that every arithmetic L function should arise in this way. So let's take a look at an example. So I've, I've written down the first few Dirichlet coefficients of an, L an arithmetic L function here. If I click on this, it should bring us to the homepage for this L function in the LMFDB. And here I'm showing, we're looking at the L function in its arithmetic normalization. This is the way you would normally um, work with it if you're coming from an ar arithmetic geometry perspective. But if we want to fit it into the world, the class of analytic L functions, we need to normalize it so that the line of the axis of symmetry is at S equals, a, at the real part of S equals a half. So let me do that by switching over to the analytic normalization. And now the coefficients don't look like integers anymore. But if you stare at them for a while, you realize that for each coefficient a sub n, if we multiply the coefficient by the square root of n, we get, we get an integer or something that looks very close to an integer. Obviously, we don't have enough precision here to tell for sure. And we're taking the square root because that's 1 half, which is the arithmetic weight divided by 2. And here you can see on the L function's homepage, we actually show the weight of the L function. In this case, it's actually denoted the motivic weight. This is also considered a synonym for the arithmetic weight because we expect they're always the same. And the other invariant of the L function that's listed here that I want to draw your attention to is a Sato Tate group. So in this case, the Sato Tate group is D21. This is one of the labels of the 52 L uh, Sato Tate groups that Frances talked about in his talk. And you can see here on the homepage of this Sato Tate group in the LMFDB, you can see moment statistics and also information about other Sato Tate groups that are contained in or contain this particular Sato Tate group. It also tells us, for example, that for this L function, we should expect the uh, trace of Frobenius, the A sub P's, to be zero three fourths of the time. Okay, let me uh, actually let me switch back one more time to the home page. So there's one other thing I wanted to note about this arithmetic L function is on the right side of the screen, we can see that this L function actually has several origin. So one of those origins, which is the way this L function, I first discovered this L function was as the L function of a genus two curve. So here's the equation of that curve. And on the genus two curves homepage, we can see many invariants of the curve as well as invariants of its Jacobian, including uh, quantities that appear in the BSD formula as well as its Sato Tate group, the same D21 we noted above. But the thing I want to draw your attention to now is that the, this genus two curve, its Jacobian actually decomposes as the product of two elliptic curves. And these elliptic curves are actually twists of each other. And this is what leads to the large number of possible origins of this L function. Because in, instead of taking the genus two curve, we could take one of the elliptic curve factors, for example, base change to a quadratic field where it becomes isogenous to the other, the other elliptic curve factor. So for example, we could go to this 
isogeny classes of, of elliptic curves over q square root of minus two. Or we could go to this isogeny class of elliptic curves over q adjoint square root of, my, of six. And both of these elliptic curves over quadratic fields have the same L function as the genus two curve that we were looking at earlier. And they both have associated modular forms that you can also find in the LMFDB. Okay. So now I'll switch back to my slides. So coming back again to the paper of uh, Farmer, Patale, Ryan, and Schmidt that I mentioned, in that paper, there's a wonderful diagram that you can find on page 21 that illustrates the relationships between various sets of L functions. And the, the thing I want to draw your attention to on this slide is these four boxes in the upper left. We have this box of L functions arising from Galois representations. These are L functions <clears throat> arising from automorphic forms, Q automorphic L functions. We have L functions arising from motives. And then we have L functions of arithmetic type. And each of the arrows in this diagram represents a conjecture that tells us that every L function in one box is equivalent to an L function in another box. And if you follow enough arrows and assume enough conjectures, you can get from any of these four boxes to any of the other ones. So all of these L functions have what on the surface appear to be different definitions and potentially um, define different sets of L, function, L functions, but conjecturally, they are all the same. And so the rest of this talk, we're going to be working under the assumption that we're working with arithmetic L functions, all of which have an associated motive. And the advantage of doing that is it gives us a well-defined notion, a, a, a well-defined way to attach a solder tape group to an L function. If we have a motiv motivic L function, we can always say that the solder tape group of the L function is just the solder tape group of a corresponding motive. Now, as we saw in the example we were just looking at, there may be many motives that lead to the same L function, but if they give the same L function, they necessarily must all have the same solder tape group. So let's start with the simplest case for rational L functions of degree weight of degree two and weight one. There are exactly three possible solder tape distributions. And these should look familiar because we saw these three solder tape uh, distributions in the first lecture in this series by Karen Kadlaya. We have SU2, which is the solder tape group of an elliptic curve over Q that does not have complex multiplication. We have uh, on the right hand side, we have the normalizer of U1. This is the solder, solder tape group of an elliptic curve over Q that has CM, complex multiplication. This spike in the middle has density one half corresponding to the fact that half of the Frobenius traces are going to be zero. And then the third possibility is uh, U1 embedded inside SU2. This is the solder tape distribution of an elliptic curve with CM defined over a field where the CM is defined. But the difference between what we're looking at on this slide and what we saw in the first talk is I'm now thinking of this purely from an L function perspective. I've forgotten the elliptic curves I'm just saying, if you give me a rational L function, an L function with rational coefficients of degree two and weight one, its solder tape group corresponds, must be one of these three possibilities. If we now consider other possibilities for the weight W and degree D of the L functions we're interested in, um, there's a whole zoo of different sources and different solder tape groups that might arise. So I've listed just some of them here. Each of these blue uh, highlighted L functions or zeta function, Dedekind and zeta functions listed here, it represents a link to the L functions modular forms database where you can go and see examples. So in weight zero, uh, if we wanted to get a weight zero degree one rational L function, the thing to do would be to take, and this is really the only thing we can do, is to take a Dirichlet character with, which is either trivial or a quadratic character. These are precisely the Dirichlet characters that are going to take uh, integer values. And this would include the Riemann zeta function, but also uh, quadratic Dirichlet L functions. If we wanted an L function of weight zero and degree two, we could instead take the L function of a weight one modular form. So let's, let's do that. 
uh, jump in here and we can take a look at this L function. So this uh, is an L function of degree two motivic weight zero. If I go over here to the list of sources, I can jump into the modular form of weight one. Notice that the weight of a modular form is always one greater than its motivic, its weight is a motive, its motivic weight is one less. So weight one modular form gives a motivic weight of zero. And it, as I'm sure many of you know, every weight one modular form is also so it has an associated art and representation. And the L function of this art and representation is necessarily the same as the L function of the, of the modular form. And this is another way once you get an L function of, deg of degree two and weight zero. More generally, we could take art and representations of, of higher dimension, not just two. And as long as we restrict our attention to art and representations that have rational traces, we will get an L a rational L function of weight zero and degree n, where n is the dimension of the art and representation. This also includes uh, Dedekind zeta functions, even though the art and, art and L functions that are factors of this Dedekind zeta function might not have rational coefficients. If we multiply them all together, we know that the Dedekind zeta function is going to have rational coefficients because its a sub n's are simply counting ideals of norm n. Moving on to weight one, we've already seen lots of examples of L functions of weight one. This, this is what you get if you take an abelian variety or a curve over a number field. These also come from modular, classical modular forms of weight two, or for in the degree four case, we could get a a weight one L function by taking a, say, a parallel weight two Hilbert modular form with rational coefficients. In weight two, there are a few other things, ways to get a weight two L function. We could take a weight three classical modular form, or we could take the symmetric square of an elliptic curve. So the elliptic curve itself is weight one degree two, but when we take the symmetric square, we get weight two and degree three. And similarly, we could even take the symmetric cube, and this would be a way of getting a weight three degree four L function. Another option for us would be to consider hypergeometric motives. And you can find many of these in the beta version of the L functions of modular forms database. If we take a hypergeometric motive, say with Hodge vector one, 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 we will get an L function of weight three and degree four. And I wanna highlight this example because the degree of the L function and the weight together determine where the Sadotate group lives. So the Sadotate group is going to be a subgroup of an orthogonal group if the weight is even, and a subgroup of a unitary symplectic group when the weight is odd. And notice that for unitary symplectic groups, this D here must be an even number. And so that tells us that when the weight is odd, only even degrees can show up. So that's why I've only listed even degrees next to one and three, but for even weights, you can get, any, you can get many different degrees. The overriding rule is that the product of the weight and the degree is always going to be an even number. What's interesting about weight three and degree four is that we get Sadotate groups that are subgroups of USP4, which is where the Sadotate groups of abelian surfaces lie. But as Francesc noted when he was uh, describing the classification of Sadotate groups of abelian surfaces, there are 55 Sadotate groups that satisfy the first two axioms he laid out. They're ruled out by the fourth axiom, uh, which he referred to as the Serre axiom. But in weight three, the, 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 that, ax, that, that axiom doesn't apply. That axiom is specific to abelian varieties. And in weight three, those three excluded Sadotate groups can actually occur. They can be realized by uh, L functions of um, weight three and degree four. In addition, there's even another connected Sadotate group that shows up in weight three. Uh, the degree two unitary group, U2, can be embedded inside USP4, and that shows up as a connected Sadotate group for, motive, for weight three motives that have degree four L functions. Okay, so I want to switch back to our focus on uh, Sadotate groups of abelian varieties and rational L functions of weight one, but I just wanted to sort of broaden the picture a bit and make sure that you uh, have a chance to see the, the larger universe of L functions and rational L functions and sort of take groups that one can attach to them. Okay, so anyone who's ever seen me uh, give a talk about uh, sort of take distributions knows that at some point, I'm going to show you an animated histogram. And so we have now reached that point.
This is uh, one of our standard examples. It's a sodic histogram for a genus two curve, y squared equals x to the fifth minus x plus one. And I'm gonna go ahead and start the animation. What you're seeing here in each frame is a histogram where on each bucket is counting the number of normalized Frobenius traces that take on a uh, lie in some subinterval of the interval from minus four to four in which we know the normalized Frobenius trace of a genus two curve must lie. And you can see that we're getting a nice smooth curve here corresponding to the solder tape group USP4. So this is a generic genus two curve. What happens if we take an, a non-generic genus two curve? Say this one. So now we're gonna get a solder tape distribution that looks quite different. Uh, you can even see in the picture, uh, starting to emerge in the picture that this solder tape uh, group is gonna ha has multiple components. And in this case, this spike in the middle actually has positive density. It's shown up here, its density is gonna turn out to be ex exactly one sixth. Of course, by the fact that one sixth of the Frobenius traces for this curve are always zero. And we can also look at ex an example in genus three. So this is a particular genus three curve and my uh, colleague uh, who was involved in writing the code that allowed us to actually compute this solid tape distribution. David Harvey likes to call this the Batman distribution for obvious reasons. And so this, this curve has a very interesting solder tape group and an interesting uh, series of uh, moments of its solder tape distribution. In this case, the spike in the middle has uh, density one fourth. Um, these spikes out both have density zero. So among the solder tape groups of abelian surfaces that are defined over Q, in addition to the generic case, there are 25 exceptional solder tape trace distributions. I've shown them here. Um, if we were to consider trace distributions of abelian surfaces over number fields, we would get a larger number. There are 36 possibilities. That's still less than 52 because the 52 solder tape distributions don't, of abelian surfaces do not all have uh, distinct trace distributions. And in dimension three, solder tape groups of abelian threefolds or genus three curves, well, there are 410 possibilities altogether for the solder tape distributions. There are 245 trace distributions. That's far too many for me to fit on a slide. What I've done instead is just shown the 14 connected solder tape groups, or these are the 14 identity components of solder tape groups that arise in dimension three. Okay, so I've been talking for a while. This might be a good time to take uh, any questions that people have on the first half of the talk. It's going great. Okay, great. <laughs> good to know there are people out there. I can see 151 of you actually are out there. So um, yeah, so now that we've uh, seen that we can think of having a side of tape group associated to an L function and we understand that to compute an L function, it's really enough to be able to compute the APs for enough uh, primes P. And I wanna spend the next, the second half of this talk, talk uh, explaining how one can do that with uh, e efficiently enough to actually produce pretty pictures like this. I mean, each of these pictures that you're seeing here involves hundreds of millions of point counting computations over primes running up to a bound that's at least at least a billion in every case, at least uh, 10 to the ninth. So there are lots of ways to compute L functions. Uh, I'm gonna focus on, on algorithms <clears throat> that are practical for, that are you know, practical to uh, run in large volume for low genus curves. And so in the table here, I'm showing algorithms that one might use to compute the L polynomials, L, L sub P. These are the uh, polynomials that show up in the Euler factor for the, the Euler product for the uh, L function of our curve. And they also show up in the numerator of the zeta function. But we wanna do this not just for one prime P, we wanna do it for all good primes or all but some finite set of excluded primes up to some bound B. And so one approach would be to just do this naively, simply, literally count points. Um, on a suitable model of the curve. And this leads to an algorithm that is roughly quasi-linear in the number of points. 
And so this is not going to be a very effective algorithm when G gets big. Um, we would be having to be taking something on the order of p cubed time, and this is for every p up to some bound b that's running up to say a billion. That's not practical. A more efficient approach, which turns out to be very efficient in the genus one case, is to actually use group computations on the Jacobian. Uh, you can use this using algorithms like uh, baby steps, giant steps. You can efficiently compute the order of the Jacobian, which gives you information about the point counts of the curve. And you can use that to get an, an algorithm that runs in time proportional to the fourth root of p in genus one, um, three, p to the three fourths in genus two. And, and it turns out to be if you also count points, which you may as well count points over fp if you're going to spend time that's at least O of p, you get an O of p algorithm in genus three. A more efficient approach asymptotically as g is growing is to use any of several p, uh, techniques based on p-adic cohomology. Kedlaya's algorithm is perhaps the most well-known example of this. And this allows you to compute the zeta function, um, including the numerator, L sub p, in time proportional, roughly proportional to the square root of p. And, and there, there, the genus is relevant here, but I'm considering a fixed genus here, so I'm not including that. But a nice thing about this algorithm is the complexity only grows with the, with a as a polynomial function of the genus. Now, those of you who are familiar with uh, Scope's algorithm or its uh, generalization to abelian varieties uh, by uh, John Pila might be wondering why we're even wasting time thinking about doing uh, algorithms that are exponential in the size of the input. I mean, the P here and the, the input size, the, if we were to write down our curve, the size of the coefficients for any prime P, or if we were to write it as integer coefficients were in, with integers on the order of B, is logarithmic. And so we would, one might hope for an algorithm whose running time is polynomial in log p. And such an algorithm exists. So this is Scope's algorithm in genus one, um, which has running time proportional to the fifth power of log p. And if you use the, the Elkies Atkin improvements, the SEA algorithm, you can even bring this five down to a four. And analogs of this when appropriately optimized, this, uh, this eight here, I think is originally due to uh, Godry and Schost. And this 14 here in genus three, this is a recent result of Abelard in his 2018 thesis. Um, so these are impressive results and really the only option when P is really big, if P is cryptographic size, but for the problem we're considering where P is never gonna be cryptographic size because by definition, if we want all of these L polynomials, the size of our output is going to be exponential in log b because we want a, a, all the primes p up to b. So we're never going to be able to make p all the, the, the upper bound on p all that big. And so within the feasible range of computation, these uh, approaches that are polynomial time in log p are not actually even competitive with the uh, other approaches that are exponential in log p. However, there is a new approach, or not so new now, this was introduced in 2014 by David Harvey, which gives uh, what he calls an average polynomial time algorithm. And the trick here, all of these other algorithms are working prime by prime, but Harvey's algorithm doesn't work prime by prime. Instead, it's gonna give you the answer for all, all the primes or all the good primes up to some bound B at once. So it's gonna be doing a computation where you have essentially no choice but to compute. You may as well compute all of them it's no faster to compute just one of them. But when you compute all of them, you get a running time that if you divide by the number of primes works out to be proportional to the fourth power of log P. And that's already better than Scope's algorithm, even in genus one. And in higher genus, it's dramatically better than any other approach that's known. Now I've highlighted in blue, the algorithm that one would actually, that I actually use to create the histograms that I've shown you. And notice that in genus one, it's not actually this log p to the fourth that's highlighted. That's because for the practical values of p, say p is two to the 40th or two to the 32, the fourth root of p is actually smaller than the logarithm of p raised to the fourth power. And even after you adjust for the constant factors, the constant factors in this line are actually better than the constant factors in this line. But once you get in genus, for genus greater than one, the average polynomial time approach is the way to go. The other point I wanna make on this slide is that for the purpose of computing L functions, 
while in principle, we might be very interested in knowing the Euler factors to compute the L function, we only really need to know the AN up to this bound B. And for the most part, that just means knowing APs. I mean, the number, the, the number of, of P squared, the number of primes P for which P squared is less than B is, that's only square root, there's only square root B of them. And there's only cube root B primes P whose cube root is less than or equal to B. So these, these even if we can afford to spend a lot more time computing uh, AP to the Ns where N is greater than one, because there's so few of them. So in fact, we could afford to use any algorithm that, we, that is linear in P to compute these AP squares and these AP cubes. So as long as we have a fast algorithm, say an average polynomial time algorithm for computing the APs, we can get a run, an overall running time that's gonna be on average log P to the fourth for each prime. And this will allow us to compute the entire L function provided we can take B to be up to some constant times the square root of the conductor of the Jacobian of our curve. Okay, and that's, and that's makes this a very feasible computation in genus one, two, and three, and even in genus four, this would still be feasible as long as the conductor is not too big. Okay. So now I wanna talk about Harvey's average polynomial time algorithm. Uh, first of all, state the result, and then I'll give some details on how one actually goes about uh, running this algorithm. So algorithm's result, <coughs> excuse me, is far more general than just computing the L function of a curve. Um, his algorithm can compute the <coughs> Haas of A zeta function of any arithmetic scheme. So let X be a scheme of finite type over spec Z. We can define the Haas of A zeta function as a product of local zeta functions where these local zeta functions at good primes anyway, they look exactly like uh, the our definition of the zeta function of a curve. We're just defining them as an, these are form, you think of these as formal power series, we're defining them as exponential generating functions where the coefficients come from point counts, where we have to remember what we mean by the point count on a scheme, the, the, the <clears throat> to count points on our, to count the FP to the R rational points on our scheme, we compute a sum over closed points and we need to weight that sum by the degree of the residue field. So the details of this will be very familiar to experts and for non-experts, the details aren't so important. What really matters is that these local zeta functions are defined, can be, you can think of these local zeta function as being defined by point counts. And as long as we can count points, we can compute each of these local zeta functions and then we can compute the complete Haas of A zeta function. And Harvey's algorithm is gonna give us a method to, to compute, simultaneously compute all of these local zeta functions and therefore compute the Haas of A zeta function, a partial Haas of A zeta function, where we're taking the Euler product up over all primes up to some bound, and that's exactly what we need to compute the L function. So this language of Haas of A zeta function is not quite the same as L function. So a natural question would be, you know, if I have a, a nice curve, X over Q, say, and I pick an integral model, I, uh, X, I could consider my integral model as an arithmetic scheme. So it has um, a Haas of A zeta, zeta function. And I could ask, what's the difference between the L function of my curve and the Haas of A zeta function of my arithmetic scheme? And the answer is, they're basically the same. They may differ, at, so at good primes, the local zeta functions will be exactly the same as the L polynomials in the Euler product for our L function. And from our multiplicity one perspective, where we know that it's enough for us to be able to understand what happens at all but finitely many primes p, that's all we need. So the primes where these, uh, the, these two functions differ aren't necessarily of concern to us, but just for uh, pedagogical purposes, it, it, I think it's important to know that they are quite the same. The, the L function and the Haas of A zeta function may, function may differ at bad primes, but they don't necessarily always differ. Um, it depends on how bad the reduction is. So for example, if I took my, the elliptic curve 49A1, so conductor 49, and I could take its minimal Weierstrass, a, a minimal Weierstrass equation as my arithmetic scheme. So here's an equation with integer coefficients. And if I compute 
the local zeta function at seven, I get minus seven t squared plus one. That's not the same as the L polynomial at seven, which is just one. The other, the other factor at seven for this, the L function of this elliptic curve is one, not uh, one minus seven t squared. On the other hand, if I were to instead look at the uh, semi-stable uh, elliptic curve 11a1, where I have semi-stable reduction at 11, the bad factors actually do agree. Okay. So now we can state Harvey's result. So let x be an arithmetic scheme. So we're going to fix that first. So x is, x is fixed. Given x, there is a deterministic algorithm that given a prime p can compute the local zeta function at p in time quasi-linear in p, or more precisely p to the log p times log p plus some small factor here, which is going to be some power of log log p. And it can do this very space efficiently using only O of log p space. If you'd like your algorithm, you'd like to compute the local zeta function a bit faster, you can do it in time that's roughly proportional to the square root of p. Now there's a factor of log p squared rather than log p to the one, but it takes more space. It's going to, you're going to need O of roughly O of square root of p space. And the third result, and the one that's most important for us, since we're interested in L functions, not just uh, zeta functions at a particular prime, is that there's a determinist al deterministic algorithm that given an integer n outputs the, Hass Hass the local Hassabe zeta functions for all the primes p up to n in time, roughly n times log n cubed using on the order of n log squared n space. Now there are n over log n primes up to n. So this is going to give us an average of log p to the fourth time per prime. And as I mentioned, in these complex, all of these complexity bounds, x is fixed. It's only p or n that are part of the input. Um, so depending on how, you know, the description of x can actually be quite important in the practical implementation of this algorithm. If the description of x is very complicated, there, there may, um, the constant factors can, can get unwieldy. But if we constrain our description of x, say we want for a hyperelliptic curve, I can say, I want you to tell me, give me x as y squared equals f of x. Don't give me the intersection of a whole bunch of equations in some high dimensional projective space. Or for example, I might say, give me a plain model for x, maybe even a singular one. I could take that as my model for x. And in the case of plane curves, one can run through uh, Harvey's description of this algorithm as given in his paper, and you get uh, a running time that is, has exactly the, the dependence on n that's in his theorem as we would expect, and the dependence on the genus of the curve is g to the 14. Now the 14 might look a little scary, but you should really think of that as a seven, because for plane curves, the description of the curve, the number of coefficients is gonna be like, is gonna increase with g squared. So in terms of relative to the size of the input, this is really only the seventh power, not a 14th power. Now, in fact, I expect one can improve this exponent a lot. This is just the bound one gets running through the proof that Harvey gives. And I should mention that these aren't just existence statements in this theorem. Harvey actually spells out the algorithm, at least in principle. Okay. Um, So now I want to say, so I want to talk a little bit about the difference between what you can do in principle and what you can do in practice. So to date, all practical implementations of Harvey's algorithm uh, compute, don't actually compute the entire local zeta function. What they do instead is they compute just the L polynomial modulo P or more precisely what they're doing is computing the Hasavit or the Cartier-Manin matrix of the reduction of a, of a curve modulo p. This is some g by g matrix with coefficients in fp for all pre primes p up to b. And the key point is that the trace of this matrix is equal to the trace of Frobenius, Frobenius modulo p. And this, knowing its value mod p, actually determines the trace of Frobenius as an integer once p is big enough. All we need is for p to be bigger than 16g squared. And that's a very small number if g is small. And for the, so for, the, for p's that are smaller than this, we could just count points naively to figure out what the uh, traces are there. And fast implementations of al the, these algorithms are available 
in the following cases. So for hyperelliptic curves over Q, this was sort of the first implementation that David Harvey and I did. Um, there are two versions of this. I only mentioned the first one for historical reasons. If you're going to read a paper, read the second one. That's where we actually figured how to, out how to do this properly. There's also an algorithm that will treat ge geometrically hyperelliptic genus three curves that are defined over cubes. So these are curves that, that have a hyperelliptic model once you base change to a quadratic field. But over Q, they're just, they look like uh, degree two covers of a pointless conic. And so the description is slightly more complicated. Um, but there is one can implement an average polynomial time algorithm for computing uh, their L polynomials mod P. And this was work that um, done by, uh, that I did with David Harvey and uh, Maki Masiera. There's also an algorithm for smooth plane cortex. Um, this is work in progress uh, that we hope to publish later this year. This is work of uh, David Harvey, Edgar Costa, and myself. And there's also an uh, algorithm for super elliptic curves uh, that I just found out has been accepted to ANTS, so I'm excited about that. And this, a preprint of this paper is available on my website. And if you're interested, if you're interested, if you're frustrated that there aren't more examples here, well, there's a toy implementation of Al Harvey's algorithm that works for any smooth plane curve. And it wouldn't be hard, it's not hard to generalize it to handle other curves as well, um, that you can find in the lecture notes for a uh, uh, summer school I gave on this last year in Bristol. And so this link will take you there and you can uh, implement the exercises that I, I gave in the summer, courts, summer school course and then extend them to actually get a, a, a fast, efficient algorithm. So there's a lot of work still to do here and I invite others to uh, join us in the efforts to compute more and more of these L functions and more and more SATA distributions. Okay. So <clears throat> in the last few minutes, um, I'm just going to very briefly try to sketch how this algorithm works. And to keep it brief, I'm going to describe it in the simplest possible case of a genus one curve, which as I already noted is actually the one case where you probably wouldn't bother to use this algorithm in the first place but that's okay, it, it's, it will help us to understand what's going on. So let's suppose we have an elliptic curve, say y squared equals a cubic. And I'm gonna consider uh, powers of this polynomial f, and I wanna consider the power, the coefficient of various powers of x in powers of this polynomial f. And we know from the, that from the Hasse invariant that we can compute the trace of Frobenius mod p by taking the coefficient of x to the p minus one over two, I'm assuming p is odd here, uh, sorry, of f to the p minus one over two, take the coefficient of, of the p minus first power of x. That's a particular coefficient of this polynomial. So you could naively do this, just compute this, exponentiate this polynomial and pull out one coefficient. That's not the most efficient thing to do. A better thing to do is to derive linear recurrences that relate uh, uh, strings of, say, three consecutive coefficients in powers, nth powers of this polynomial f. And so one can easily write down a, a linear recurrence that relates these coefficients. And then you can express those recurrence relations in a matrix. And then if you write down a starting vector, which if we took the, our n to be zero, that would be a very easy polynomial to write down because we would know it only had one non-zero coefficient. That's the constant coefficient would be one. So we could start with a, a base vector of, of zero, zero, one, and then multiply it by uh, this matrix enough times. So that n here, we could fix that to be p minus one over two, and we could let k run from zero to p minus one and compute the vector we would get when we multiply our initial vector by a uh, product of matrices. So we've reduced the problem of computing a particular coefficient of a particular power of this polynomial to computing the product of a bunch of matrices times a vector. And so this gives this expression here, gives the, that computation with appropriate scaling to make sure we get the right answer. And if we write down this matrix in the case where we're fixing n to be p minus one over two, and we only now think of it as a matrix modulo p rather than a matrix with integer entries, we get a matrix that doesn't actually depend on p. 
I mean, it's, it implicitly does because we're thinking about it mod p, but we could now just think of these as integers and do these matrix multiplications over the integers and reduce mod p at the end. And so we wind up with a formula that tells us we can compute all of these traces of Frobenius that we want by computing a product of matrices times an initial vector modulo p. And that leaves us with the following problem. We have a sequence of matrices. We have a sequence of moduli. Here, our moduli are just going to be primes. And we want to compute the whole sequence of partial products of take the first you know, k matrices and the first k moduli. And we want to compute the product of those matrices modulo, say, the kth moduli. And we can turn this into a recursive algorithm where we pair up matrices and we pair up moduli and reduce it to a smaller instance of the same problem. And this gives us what's known as an accumulating remainder tree. This recursion defines a tree where at the, at the bottom we have just individual matrices and we have a tree of matrices, we have a tree of moduli. We go work our way up the tree by computing products and then we work our way down the tree by reducing products, modulus, appropriate products, subproducts, modulo, appropriate products of moduli. And at the leaves, we wind up with what we want, these values here, products of matrices, uh, product of matrices m0 up to m, m sub n minus 1, modulo the nth modulus. And when you put all this together, the depth of the tree is on the order of log b. In each recursive step, we're multiplying and reducing a bunch of 3 by 3 matrices. The total bit size of the data involved is on the order of b log b. We know we can do multi multiplication in quasi-linear time. The size of the matrices is fixed. So 3 times 3 or 3 cubed is just a constant factor. And we wind up with an algorithm that allows us to compute the entire tree and all the reductions in time proportional, proportional to b times log b cubed. And if we think of this as an average over primes, it's going to give us the log p to the fourth that we want. And one can also use these same matrix products, you could compute those for a single prime p and get the O of p to the one half time algorithm that I mentioned earlier. So I'll just end with an open problem. So we've solved the problem of, we've seen that we can solve the problem of computing all of the point counts for a fixed uh, arith uh, curve or a fixed arithmetic scheme up to some bound in time, average polynomial time. That's at time that is average, on average polynomial in the size of the input. But it would be really nice to have a polynomial time algorithm that would actually take just a single curve over a finite field and tell you how many points are on that curve in time polynomial in, in the input. We don't have that yet. If you fix the genus, we do. So Scope's algorithm is polynomial time, but that's because G is hardwired to one. But if my algorithm is supposed to take an arbitrary curve of arbitrary genus, even if this, even if I restricted to hyperelliptic curves, the description of the curve, the number of coefficients grows with the genus. So the size of the input is on the order, in the case of a hyperelliptic curve, it would be like g log p, or for a plane curve, it'd be like g squared log p. And we don't have an algorithm whose running time is polynomial in that quantity. So I'll leave that as an open problem for people to think about for the future. Okay, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Drew. That was a wonderful talk. Um, let's start. There were some questions from Andrew Obis in the in the chat window. Um, sorry, Yellow. Okay. Can, can I talk? Can people hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I had a question about the hyper and and super elliptic curves to the, the extent that one does better with those than with uh, regular curves for this g to the fourteenth factor. Um, so actually, I looked at the, I, I looked just quickly at the papers that you mentioned there. And so you have these algorithms that work for curves given by, you know, y to the n equals f of x, where f is a separable polynomial. So it's like a smooth plane curve with some stuff at infinity. Yep. Is this fundamentally easier than other cyclic covers of P1 that maybe don't have a form like that? You know, like no. just with a branch cycle description that doesn't, it's not one, 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 one. Great question. The answer is no, it's not fundamentally easier. In fact, it's fundamentally harder. So huh. the, uh, the good news is for those who are interested in branched covers, 
Um, the formulas to describe the cartier manin matrix are a little more complicated to work to write down, but this has been done. Uh, Irina Bao has, has computed uh, formulas for the coefficients of the cartier manin matrix, uh, the, uh, the matrix of the cartier manin operator. They're specified and they're coefficients of some power of the polynomial defining the curve. And one can work out the details of the algorithm. So I didn't do that in my paper to the disappointment of, of some of my colleagues, um, just because it was more complicated and it's not gonna fit into an ANTS uh, submission. But yes, you should, uh, it should not be, uh, it'll be hard to work out the details, but once you've worked out all the details, the running time of the algorithm will actually be faster because the matrix is smaller, right? I mean, in terms of the size of the, the degree of the polynomial, the genus, if you have uh, repeated roots in your polynomial, the genus is gonna drop. And so the size of the matrices you're working with is gonna go down. And so the running time of the, of the algorithm will actually be slightly faster. Yeah. Faster relative to the degree of the polynomial, but kind of the same relative to if you're the genus exactly, is. Yeah, so, uh, in focus. terms of dependence okay. on the genus, it gotcha. should be the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's see, there's also a question from Fabian Pazuki. So, well, hi, guys. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for your talk, Andrew. It was amazing. Um, so the question is a bit vague. It's a, I was a bit surprised by the fact that the, the Batman you showed, the density was not, didn't seem to be C1. I mean, it looked like it has spikes, right? So uh, I was a bit curious. Do you know if, um, let's say we fix genus two, you showed us the, the connected component, the, like the connected groups, I think, the case of connected groups. Sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. I'm trying to get to your Batman. This is the, <clears throat> this is the picture you're asking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, yes. Then we can see that you have these spikes going on. Yeah. So do, do you know, say, for genus 2 curves, if it has some kind of meaning in a different way, that uh, maybe the, the density there is not as nice, maybe as a sine function or a Gaussian or... It's a bit vague, but I mean, it, it looks a bit strange that this density has spikes like that. So I don't know, can you see something? Let's say, you know, the curve has a meaning over Q, the model is integer, so maybe the rank is special or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so let me answer that. Um, so it's misleading on the picture, but in fact, this spike is way more spikier. The spike in the middle is way more spikier than these spikes, by which I mean, this spike in the middle has positive density. But yeah, you for, said that. For the trace, none of the other spikes can have positive density. You can only have positive density at zero. Okay. Um, where these, that's not true if we looked, I didn't show them in this, in any of these animations, but in, uh, if you were to look at a histogram for the A2 coefficient, say for the middle coefficient of the L polynomial of an abelian surface, um, for the, or in general, for the even index coefficients of the L polynomial, you can get positive density at other integer values. But for the odd coefficients, uh, you can't get positive density except at the middle. That doesn't mean there's not something interesting happening here. Mm. I, mean, I think what's happening here is that there is a uh, CM elliptic curve factor or isogeny factor at some, over some base extension um, or some, something similar and you're seeing a component here where this is really trying to be, uh, whoop, sorry, one of these guys. So you'll see here, these are approaching infinity at the edge of the interval. And I think that is what is responsible for the spikes that you're seeing in the Batman picture. Mm -hmm. But for the A2 coefficient, uh, it's actually quite useful to look at the positive, de the which, so that uh, in genus two, for in any integer from minus two up to two, you can get positive density. And that's actually a really useful thing to look at when you're trying to compute uh, what, determine what the Sadotate group is or to, tr or to try to distinguish two Sadotate groups. You can often have histograms that look very, very similar on the screen, but the density of the spikes is quite different. And, this, and the density of the spikes is something you can, quick, you can compute very quickly because the denominator, in the case of, of genus two anyway, these are all rational numbers whose denominator can't, has, can't, has to divide 48. 
So you can tell them apart, even with only a few thousand APs, you can tell, you can tell what these um, densities are looking like. And we use this also in, 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 in the project that's still ongoing in genus three, we're using information about the, both the, the trace zero density for the A1 and the A3 coefficients and also the positive density integers for A2 to help distinguish. Um, but whether there's more one can say sort of from an arithmetic perspective, yeah, I think that's a great question. Maybe I can add one comment. Yeah, please do. So just a, just a, a comment. Uh, so there, I think Fabian asked at some point specifically about connected groups. If you look at connected groups, you can still have these uh, zero density spikes like the one for the CM elliptic curve, but I believe you can't have positive density spikes uh, when the group is connected. All right. Thank you. Great. Let's see. Any other questions here? Also, also you mentioned doing stuff for higher genus. Can you do things for, say, a billion varieties that are maybe in principle polarized but aren't Jacobians? Yeah. So. <clears throat> In principle, there's no reason not to. I guess the trick is we need, um, we need to be able to write down a description of the abelian variety. Now, one easy way to do what you're suggesting, and in fact, the way I computed a lot of the pictures on you see on the screen here is I cheated. Um, I didn't actually necessarily find, go and find a, a curve defined over Q with this identity component. What I did instead is like, I can compute U1 cross U1 cross U1. I just take three elliptic curves with CM, whose CM fields are different. So I know they're non-isogenous. And I can compute the L function of the, of the product or the direct sum of the mo motives just as a product of L functions. And I can compute this, the histogram from that. So if you can describe your abelian variety for me, whether it's polarized or not, I, you know, the, the algorithms don't really care about, principally polarized or not, the algorithms don't really care about that. They just care about having a description that you can write down. So certainly for computing products and also quotients. I mean, there are situations where maybe, maybe your abelian variety is a prim variety. Um, say, say I want an abelian surface that's, uh, you know, cut out uh, uh, coming from a prim variety defined by a map from a genus three curve to an elliptic curve. As long as I can run my algorithm on the, on the genus three curve and on the elliptic curve, I can tell you exactly what the quotient looks like and I can compute the distribution. So I think probably the, the best approach in general for, you know, if you want to treat arbitrary abelian varieties that are not necessarily principally polarized is to try to express them as a prim and then run this algorithm on the top and the bottom of your prim. Great, let's see any other questions. Great, yep. let's see any other questions. Although in that case, you wind up with time to deal with higher genus than you would otherwise. This is true. And you know, I'm, I'm open to suggestions, but my instinct is that um, I'd be willing to accept bumping the genus up one or two versus having to try and write down explicit equations for my abelian variety as a variety. That sounds a lot more difficult to me. Um, but if there are other ways of describing the varieties you're interested in, there may be more efficient approaches. Certainly if you can describe your variety as a product of other varieties, that's a huge help because we can work on the, on the products independently. And it's also another thing that we have done. I mean, that might sound like a, well, that's you know, trivial, but another thing you can do, and this is how we had to do some of these things to realize some of the abelian threefolds that show up in our classification is maybe we're defining our abelian variety by you know, taking a, a twist by some HECA character or some other you know, construction where the L polynomials we're interested in are actually computed in a somewhat complicated way, taking as input you know, L polynomials coming from things that are easy to compute and then manipulating them in some fashion. And as long as we know theoretically that that's going to give us the actual answer of the abelian variety we know exists but is too painful to write down explicitly, um, that's another approach one can take. 
I mean, one thing that I was thinking about it, if we got to genus four is Mumford varieties. Yeah, I, I haven't thought hard about the genus four case yet, but I know that's, you know, that's sort of the obvious next thing to look at. And I'm definitely uh, very interested in it. Um, even, you know, aside from the classification question, just being able to compute, compute them efficiently, I think it's very much within the realm of computation and a lot of new interesting phenomena show up in genus four. Uh, I mean, I sort of feel like for G equals one, two, three, and four, something brand new and exciting and interesting happens at every step. I'm not sure if that happens again at, at genus five or not, but, I'll, uh, but for the moment, I'm very motivated to move on to genus four. Well, thank you again, Drew. This has been a, a fabulous talk. And uh, the next talk will be by David Zawina on May 5th. And let's all thank Drew uh, one more time.